Good afternoon all. My name is Sophie Hooper, the Head of Policy and Research at IWFM, and I will be your host for today's webinar, which is brought to you in collaboration with ARC Workplace Risk. We are collaborating with ARC on a series of webinars and guidance around managing risks of facilities management and property, and you can find our previous episodes of Structural Risks and Safety Management Systems on our MTT webinar pages for your playback at a time that is convenient to you. Now, I am pleased to say that once again, I am joined by the eminent David Hills, who will present on all things fire risk assessment and what today's and tomorrow's fire safety order requirements are and will be. Now, David will explain his full background in a moment during the presentation, but his close links with policymakers in government and the HSC and building safety regulators mean he is one of the few in his field. Um, the aim of today is to update people on where we are for now uh, for all things fire risk assessment and how we got here, what the changes are that we're expecting from a cultural perspective, what the requirements of Section 156 of the Building Safety Act 2022 mean for all risk assessment, including those beyond the residential buildings. Um, David will also talk through the different types of fire risk assessment for residential blocks and the new principles around the management of risk. Um, we will also discuss some practical insights on what your fire risk assessments will need to cover from now on and how fire and how risk management needs to change, especially for those managing residential blocks. And that's because there are new prescribed principles contained in secondary legislation following the Building Safety Act. We have also set aside uh, 15 minutes of the webinar for questions from you, the audience. So I would like to encourage you to ask questions throughout. Um, we will pick them up and discuss them after the presentation, but please put them in the Q&A box as and when you think of them, not the chat, because we use that for other communications. Um, and if you want to stay anonymous, then you can, of course, uh, do that. So, uh, David, I am going to hand over to you so you can start your presentation and um, take us through. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. Ah, um, OK, so I'm going to share my screen now then. OK, well, hopefully everybody can now see my screen. Um, right. So um, I'm going to start by actually saying that, you know, this is a moving target. Um, the subject sur surrounding fire risk assessments um, has been raised within the Grenfell Tower uh, Public Inquiry Phase 2 report, and we are only three weeks since then. So it is very likely that things are going to change yet further. But what I intend to do today is to actually take you through how and try and demystify what actually Section 156 of the Act actually means. And as Sophie was saying there, it isn't just about um, residential blocks. This this particular piece of the of the Act has a, a major impact on all types of uh, property uh, and how risk assessment is actually undertaken. So. Um, just very quickly then, um, I'm David Hills, I'm Senior Director. I've worked with ARC for about 24, just over 24 years. Um, I am a, a Chartered Surveyor, Fire Engineer and a Health and Safety Consultant. And I've actually undertaken fire risk assessments in some of the largest buildings uh, in the UK. Um, just very quickly, very, very quickly about ARC. And I just really want to um, just mention the fact that we've got over 500 clients who who rely upon us trust us and and uh, and experience the way that we work and it's from that um i'm actually basing uh, uh that experience sorry i'm actually basing what i'm going to be talking about today um we are and uh, as sophie said we we do operate and we do work with the regulator with health and safety executive and other professional bodies as well to actually make sure that our clients are actually well up to date and that the, the systems and services that we provide are suitable and sufficient. So what are we going to cover? I'm going to do a very quick introduction. I'm then going to take you through the, the changing climate 
I'm going to take you through how we actually got here and the fact that we've actually got two regimes now that have two different and sometimes opposing requirements, um, especially in respect of uh, residential, but on the other side as well. I'm going to take you through the impact of Section 156. I'm going to take you then through the, the four different types of um, residential fire risk assessment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of the major issues that has come out of the Grenfell Tower inquiry is the fact that whilst people are actually undertaking risk assessments, many are using it as a tick box exercise. Um, and therefore, what they are looking for now is for ongoing advice, ongoing legislation in order to force people to actually undertake the works that stem from fire risk assessments um, in a much more uh, prompt manner. Um, and therefore, the management of risk is going to be really important. And from that, they've actually set out a, a series of what they call prescribed principles on how you should be managing risk. And whilst at the moment that only applies to residential blocks, it does also impact other buildings as well. I want to quickly then end uh, on the potential consequences of getting this wrong and talk about any conclusions and then answer any of your questions. So. How do we get to where we are now? Obviously, the Building Safety Act has introduced a new framework for managing safety. Um, it's only going to be applicable at the moment in England, and it at the moment only applies to certain types of building. But again, the Grenfell Tower Inquiry um, uh, report has made it very clear that they believe that the definition of high-risk building is arbitrary, um, and they are looking for a different approach to rather than just be buildings that are residential, um, they are going to look at other buildings as well. So there is a potential very soon for some changes in the definition of what um, a high risk building is. And therefore that framework could be and is probably likely to be extended to uh, different types of buildings. There's a growing emphasis as well to actually look at buildings as a whole system. And that is, again, very important because the vast majority of people who undertake fire risk assessments tend to focus on the areas that they have control in. Uh, and invariably, that's going to include areas, the common areas only. But I think the difficulty we, we have is that if you were to take the number of fires that have occurred in just blocks of flats over the last two or three years, 90% uh, of them actually don't actually uh, have an impact or actually start within the common areas. They are in the tenants and residents demised areas. Uh, and yet most people undertake risk assessments that focus away from that. The, 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 the framework is really looking for us to actually have a, a whole building approach. And, and the regulations are effectively aimed at trying to prevent accidents and uh, also enhance safety standards. And by doing that, they're actually looking to hold people to account. So the, the act right from the very beginning, from the bill stage right the way through, has always been looking into to usher in this new era of accountability, whether you are a developer, whether you're a designer, a contractor, an owner, or whether you are a property or a facilities manager, you all have a degree of accountability. And so that's really important that we actually understand that particular part. And the other element that the Act is trying to achieve is to actually have this change in culture, um, and whether, again, it is design, construction and management. Cultural change is key. And at the moment, according to uh, the, the new minister for building safety, uh, Mrs. Ali, she has actually made it very clear just a couple of days ago that she is of the opinion that the, the industry isn't changing its culture quick enough. Um, there's always going to be the carrot and stick. So there's an opportunity there, a potential there that we, we could get something through uh, in respect of that. Now, central to the new framework is risk assessment um, and very importantly, effective risk management. And that is a really important part. Risk assessment is the key. Everything stems from a risk assessment. If you were to go back to the, the basis of your safety case report, if you're talking about a residential block, for example, it has to stem from your risk assessment. Um, and then you've got to be able to prove that you are effectively managing risk. Now, there's been some historical issues 
uh, with uh, risk assessments. And again, if you look at the Grenfell Tower inquiry report, it makes it very clear that they are extremely concerned with those historical issues. Again, the, the race to the bottom, the, the cheapest option generally wins, and the cheapest option isn't always the most appropriate for that building or for those residents or for the tenants themselves. And what we're seeing as well is conflicting advice and recommendation from the various parties, the local authority, fire and rescue authorities, and the building safety regulator. So that's really where we've got to at the moment. And so section 156 of the act, just very, very quickly, before I go into the detail later, actually amends the regulatory reform fire safety order. I'm gonna call it the fire safety order from now on. And, and that actually came into force um, on the 1st of October last year. So we're almost a year into this. Um, and yet we're still seeing um, the same types of risk assessment and the same issues that are stemming from this. And we are also seeing um, issues where the regulators, the, the building safety regulator and the local fire and rescue services are starting now to kick back on risk assessments, um, effectively saying that these aren't suitable and sufficient. So just so we are all aware, and, and Sophie mentioned it uh, earlier, and it's very, very important that we understand that Section 156 actually amends the actual fire safety order. And the fire safety order affects all types of buildings and all workplaces. There are some um, uh, exemptions, but any type of residential building, commercial office building, retail building, industrial, et cetera, is covered by the changes to the um, the fire safety order. So we need to be very aware of that. This, this isn't just residential. Now, as I go through the presentation, you will see I mentioned residential quite a few times, and that's because there are some certain specific issues surrounding that. But the, the basic aim of section 156 is to actually improve the quality of fire risk assessments for all, not just within the residential sphere. So, how are we changing the culture? What, what is actually happening uh, and what is the, the act and the subsequent regulation and the amendments to the fire safety order actually trying to do? Well, first things first, we, we've got a changing climate. That regulatory focus now is very, very clearly on firstly construction and construction products. There is a, a huge piece of work that's going to be working on that and then on accountability. And it's that accountability element that fits across the board because um, accountability doesn't just sit with a few people. Those who are actually undertaking risk assessments are accountable to ensure that they are suitable and sufficient. Those who are procuring them need to make sure that they are the right, right type and of the right quality. Those who are actually managing risk are accountable to ensure that they are remediating works uh, as quickly as possible and ensuring that they are delivering safe um, environments for people to live, work um, and, and play. So it's really important that we understand where that regulatory focus is. Accountability isn't just about uh, principal accountable persons and accountable persons under the uh, Building Safety Act. Accountability goes all the way down to everybody um, who is actually involved with risk management, facilities management, and property management. I think the other element as well is that there is a change in expectation, um, especially on corporate entities, but it also has an impact on the individuals. So you have a certain degree of uh, corporate and personal accountability that stems from the Building Safety Act, Section 161 is really important. And it's if you don't know that particular one, it's worthwhile having a look at it. Um, it is included in many other pieces of legislation, and it is now being included in almost every piece of new legislation that's coming out and effectively turns around and says that as an organization, you are responsible. But if you have directors, officers or, or managers or someone else who purports to be that, then um, if they are negligent, if they are uh, consent to poor management and or if they connive to deliver poor management, then not only will they be liable personally, but the business will also be liable for their actions. <coughs> Excuse me. So there is a need for increased information 
um, as well, and clarity and detail within the actual risk assessments themselves. The, the old approach that many used to use, which is a, a tick box and then leave it at that, is not now going to be acceptable. It hasn't been acceptable since October last year. Um, and then I want to go into detail specifically about that um, as we go through this presentation. Um, and the other element that's changing in respect of the culture is competence and being able to prove it. Um, and that, again, has been highlighted within the um, Grenfell Tower inquiry. One of the major and headline recommendations within that inquiry report makes it very clear that they want the government to set up a, a brand new uh, scheme to monitor, manage and accredit fire risk assessors. It doesn't matter what type of property, whether it's high risk, whether it's low risk, those assessors, they want to have um, accredited so they can monitor their qualifications, monitor their uh, continuing professional development and being able to be able to prove it through an accredited scheme. And that culture as well is also changing. You know, we've got lots of carrots out there, to, you know, if asking industry to take responsibility. Uh, and, and if industry fails to do so, then there is that stick that, that's out there. there is, there's a change in the enforcement regime. We've got now much more targeted enforcement action being um, uh, exercised, especially for high risk buildings where there are higher fines that are in place and potentially, especially for high risk buildings, uh, the potential for jail sentences. So I think it's really important that we understand that there are uh, there is a change in culture already in place. Uh, there is a need for industry to catch up with that change as well. So how did we get here? Um, we obviously had the, the, um, the Building Safety Act come out in 2022, as, as Sophie mentioned there. But prior to that, we actually had a significant change to fire risk assessment requirements in the first place under what's called the Fire Safety Act of 2021. It effectively clarified and then extended the scope of the fire safety order um, to include multi-occupied residential buildings. Before that, it was all about workplaces. And in addition to that, the scope of the risk assessment had to include the building structure, the external walls, as well as the common parts. So we couldn't just focus on the common parts anymore. In addition, the risk assessment had to include things such as the external walls, the, the doors, um, the uh, and anything that's actually attached to that particular external wall, such as balconies, breeze solaires, uh, solar panels, for example. Um, and finally, the uh, extension of the scope also uh, made sure that um, fire doors um, between the domestic premises and common parts were also included. So again, it, it started to move us away from that very myopic approach of um, just doing the common areas to actually now extending it out and extending the scope of risk assessments. Um, and in addition to that, the final element was really all about the fact that there needed to be a regular and formal review of those risk assessments at defined times and in defined circumstances. So that was the first element. We then had the act. Um, and then out of that as well, we also had what's called the Fire Safety England regulations, which came out just after the Building Safety Act. And that effectively uh, introduced a set of uh, particular requirements that came out of the Phase 1 Grenfell Tower Inquiry Report, which said that all occupied, uh, multi-occupied residential blocks, for example, um, had to have clear and relevant fire safety instructions for all relevance, um, and also that information should include information about the importance of fire doors. In addition to that, buildings that were in excess of 11 metres height had to have annual checks of their fire entrance doors, as well as quarterly checks of all fire doors within the building as well. And then the, the other element was about high rise or high risk buildings, buildings that were 18 metres or seven storeys or more, and effectively, the requirements are that uh, you have to provide certain building plans and provide them uh, in a digital form to the fire and rescue services. 
that you had to inform the fire and rescue services of your external walls. Um, the important element in respect to facilities management was that there was a need now to actually undertake a far more regular check of the operational status of key fire safety equipment, including firefighting lifts, uh, evacuation lifts, um, and um, firefighting uh, equipment such as sprinkler systems, dry risers, um, a, fire alarms, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those now have to undertake a regular check, a monthly check. And there is a requirement that if there are significant issues that cannot be fixed within 24 hours, that they have to be informed, uh, the fire and rescue services have to be informed. And there's a requirement for secure information boxes and also to make sure that there was a need for wayfinding signage. And I said, it was a, a specific um, response to the uh, Grenfell Tower Inquiry Phase 1 report. And then we had the actual Act itself. So we then have Section 156 of the Building Safety Act, which came into force, as I said, on the 1st of October, and it applies to all types of buildings. It basically suggested that fire risk assessments needed to be completed in full. Previously, the fire safety order used to talk about the fact that you only had to record substantive risks. Well, that is now gone. You have to include all fire risks that you need to include um, and at least take reasonable steps to provide all of the details of what's called the relevant persons. Um, and those relevant persons aren't just the owners. If we've got um, commercial tenants, then they are going to be relevant persons as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, as well as the accountable persons and principal accountable persons and that you've got to cooperate with each other when it comes to fire risk assessment. So it's about sharing information about fire and fire safety. It's about making sure that when a responsible person leaves the building, that they share all of the information they have on fire risks with the new responsible person. And also, uh, if we have a residential block, um, then the responsible persons, the managing agents, the facilities managers, for example, must provide residents with relevant fire safety information over and above that uh, provided in respect of the fire safety England regulations. So we can see we've we've had a, a, a significant number of changes to fire risk assessments um, since 2021. Um, but what we are not seeing at the moment, according to the regulator and according to the HSC, is this actually really changing the way that risks are managed? And that's one of the areas that they are extremely concerned about. Um, so one of the problems though, in respect of this is that we have two different regimes. We have a regime under the regulator reform fire safety order, the fire safety order, which is actually not enforced by the regulator or the HSC. It's enforced by the fire and rescue services. Um, on a local basis. Now, that requires that responsible persons who are normally managing agents or facilities managers, plus any other commercial tenancies, uh, tenants, look at the areas for which they are responsible. And that generally means that for managing agents and facilities managers, that's going to be the common areas. Um, and it still is the case that um, uh, those that common area coverage of a fire risk assessment or if we're a residential block of type one is generally going to be acceptable and that's still going to be perfectly acceptable in order to meet the requirements in many instances of the fire safety order one caveat on that is that we are seeing on a much more regular basis now fire and rescue services actually saying you know what this isn't applicable. We need to understand the risks associated with the tenants here. And they are often suggesting that people extend the scope, whether it's uh, informally or whether it's formally via a notice, to actually extend the scope of the fire risk assessments. And we're seeing that on a much more uh, frequent basis. Now, the, the Building Safety Act and all of its secondary legislation is actually not enforced by the um, uh, fire and rescue service, but enforced by the building safety regulator. And in this instance, we've got accountable persons. And that's normally uh, owners, um, and it's generally not managing agents, 
or facilities managers. And all of the guidance, all of the statements that are coming out of the regulator themselves is that we have to take this whole building approach. And they are really looking, especially in residential blocks, for what's called a type three or type four um, in order to be considered acceptable. Um, and they are reviewing them as well. Um, and therefore, we need to include um, a, a sample of, of the tenancies, including the commercial tenants, if we have them. So we now have those that two regime problem in the fact that we've got um, one enforcer um, who is going to be only interested in the areas for which you are responsible for, whereas the building safety regulator, another enforcer, is much more focused on a whole building approach. Um, to be brutally honest, I think we are going to see a shift in, uh, in, in legislation and in guidance. And I think the, the whole concept of the type one for residential blocks is probably going to go at some stage, um, but it's certainly not going at the moment. So I just really wanted to make sure that that was very clear. It, it's there at the moment, but we can see that, that, that desire for change um, at, at all levels to actually make sure that the, the guidance in respect of what constitutes a good, suitable and sufficient risk assessment needs to be improved. And in fact, the, the uh, Grenfell Tower Inquiry report makes that very clear as well. So what's the regulator's review uh, view sorry, on suitable and sufficient? Well, there is no definition of suitable and sufficient in the fire safety order. And so therefore, everything is based upon um, subject uh, subjection and opinion when it's actually therefore being reviewed but in order for an assessment to be considered suitable and sufficient under the requirements of section 156 then the assessment has got some key areas in which to look at first things first we've got to ensure that the building of the assessment has sufficient coverage and that coverage is really important because it we need to actually understand where the risk of fire will emanate from and what um, prevention and preventative measures are in place to prevent that spreading into other areas of the building. That it's got to provide a full and detailed justification um, of the fire safety arrangements that are in place. We can't just say, for example, fire doors are in place. Well, what type of fire doors? Where are they? What are they doing? Who are they protecting? So we've got to provide commentary now um, and we've got to uh, provide an, a, an assessment on the acceptance or not of the fire safety measures that are actually in place, um, as well as determining exactly what additional elements are required based upon assessment. And all of that has got to include the evidence that you are basing upon, um, what is provided, what's missing, what additionally is going to be required and why. Um, and also, where are those risks placed? Where are they posed from? Is it in a residential area? Is it a commercial area? Is it in the common area? We need to understand in order for that risk assessment to be suitable and sufficient under the, the new elements here, what and where the risks are coming from. It's got to provide a full technical consideration and it's got to cover all areas of fire safety. Um, one of the areas of concern is that a, a lot of fire risk assessors in the past, because they haven't had, for example, insurance, have stated, well, we we're, here's our fire risk assessment, but by the way, we are excluding the external walls. That cannot be accepted. That does not, therefore, constitute a suitable and sufficient risk assessment. So we need to make sure that all areas of fire risk need to be covered. And where possible, we need to make sure that uh, those who are involved um, um, or affected by the risks are actually included within the process. Um, and finally, as I said, the, the statement that comes out of the, um, uh, the section is that we need to consider all the risks taking into account the number of people who may be affected. And we are seeing that that particular statement is where fire and rescue services are actually suggesting that particular types of fire risk assessment or the scope of those fire risk assessments are being changed or are being requested for a much more detailed and a larger scope. So the greater the number of people 
in a particular building, the greater the uh, need for um, a much more detailed, in-depth, um, a greater scope of fire risk assessment than's actually recommended. So, in addition to the suitability and sufficiency of the um, fire risk assessment, the section 156 and the amendment to the FSO requires that responsible persons, as I said earlier, looks at or and ascertains where possible the, the details, not just the, the names, it's the names, address and contact details um, in the UK, by the way, um, of all other responsible persons and any other accountable persons. In addition, they've got to share all of that fire safety information with incoming responsible persons if they're going. But I think it's really important that we also understand that fire risk assessments can't just be this long dirge of, of uh, risks and, and actions. Under the Fire Safety England regulations, there is a need to provide key information to um to the residents. And that also has been highlighted and um, uh, improved with the introduction of what's called the higher risk buildings keeping provision of information, England regulations, that's easy to say, which basically means that accountable persons and principal accountable persons now need to provide a summary. And so the fire risk assessments also have got to be provided in such a way that they can be read by anybody not just people who understand fire risk, but by all persons. Um, so they've got to be written in very clear English, very um, uh, easy to understand. And if your building has a significant number of persons who don't uh, read or speak English or read English, um, then you've got to look at other ways in which to be able to communicate that information to them as well. Okay. I just wanted to give some examples of the type of things we're talking about here when we are thinking about um, the commentary that comes within uh, a fire risk assessment. I talked earlier about the fact that many used to go for a tick box, um, which 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 was satisfactory at the time, but it's clearly not going to be suitable going forward. So I've got some typical um, uh, comments here uh, in respect to fire risk assessments that, that we've seen from from many different types of fire risk assessments. So vertical mechanical smoke extract stroke AOVs are installed. Well, that's great. The fact that they're installed is great. But under section 156 and the amendment to the fire safety order, assessors have now got to provide a lot more detail. They've got to explain what type of ventilation system it actually is. Where is it? What is it doing? What is it covering? Is it satisfactory? And why is that? So what is the evidence that suggests that it's satisfactory? And is it being maintained and managed effectively? Statements such as a fire alarm system is provided and covers the common areas and is in line with BS 5839 part one. Great. The fact that we've got a system is great. But again, under the act, under the amendments, assessors have got to be far more specific and provide far more details. What type of fire alarm system is it? What is it doing? Is, is it detection only? Is it the detection and alarm? What is it designed to do? Is it L1, 2, 3, 4, 5? What is it actually designed to actually operate? What is it activating? And is it satisfactory and why? What's the evidence to suggest that everything's fine? And things such as fire doors were noted to be satisfactory. Well, that's again, great. But we've got also then to outline what fire doors, where are they? What are they doing? What what's what are who are they protecting, and why are they satisfactory? What what evidence do we have to prove this? And at the end of the day, this is now all about proving what you are seeing as you undertake your fire risk assessment. Previously, it's been accepted that sometimes tick boxes with no commentary or tick boxes with a little bit of commentary is perfectly acceptable. That is not going to be acceptable for the vast majority of cases going forward. There has to be a greater degree of commentary. Um, and that is what this is trying to achieve. Okay, so just very, very quickly then, um, I'm not gonna spend many seconds on this particular part, but if you are undertaking a safety case report, your fire risk assessment has got to 
supplement it. It's got to um, support that process rather than be a hindrance to your safety case report. And there is a, a lot of guidance out there now issued by the, the Home Office and the Building Safety Regulator that talks about justification of the preventative and protection measures uh, or steps, as they like to call it, um, have got to be based upon an assessment for the whole building. Um, and everything they talk about, it's all about whole building, whole building approach, whole building approach to um, the uh, fire risk assessments. And in addition to that, the guidance relating to Section 156 also talks about the fact that the purpose of the requirement is to make sure that responsible persons and accountable persons take a whole building approach to the building and fire safety within higher risk buildings. So we can see, therefore, that your fire risk assessment, if you have got a HRB, um, has got to complement it rather than hinder it. And by only focusing on common areas, um, I would suggest, um, and the comments that we've already seen from the regulator on some safety case reports, is that if someone's only undertaking a type one fire risk assessment, because it's a residential block, then it's not going to be suitable and sufficient for their purposes. Um, and they are therefore sending the thing back saying, no, we need this. And by the way, you've got 14 days in which to do something which isn't a particularly helpful uh, or easy period of time to deal with. So I talked about type one, type two, and type three, and type four. So I just really want to very, very quickly go through this before I move on to the, the more important part, which is about what we do with the actual requirements. So we're awaiting a new British standard, um, uh, which will provide us with some new definitions on the different types of fire risk assessment. That British standard comes about because uh, PAS 79 Part 2 has been withdrawn, and we've got a, a new version, which is called uh, BS 9272. Um, uh, and that particular standard uh, has been out for public consultation, and we are now awaiting the final version. But it effect effectively sets out the principles for the four different types of fire risk assessments, and they differ in respect of what is being inspected and the degree and use of intrusive techniques. And so effectively, we've got a type one, which deals with the common areas and is a non-intrusive nature, whereas a type two is, again, non-intrusive in nature, but covers the common, er uh, the common areas as well as the uh, tenants. Uh, sorry, I got that wrong there. It covers the common areas, but it is an intrusive uh, in investigation, whereas a type three deals with the common areas and the demised areas, generally a sample, um, and it's non-intrusive, whereas a type four covers the same as scope, but is again, far more intrusive in nature. But just so we are aware, these only apply to residential blocks. Uh, types of assessment are only applicable to the residential blocks um, and do not, um, uh, and should not be referred to when it comes to uh, commercial, risk assessments and, and the like. So type one, it's a very basic assessment. Um, it will be satisfac satisfactory under the regulator reform fire safety order. It relies upon the duty holder and the res responsible persons having a really good understanding of their building um, and of the fabric. So they are very confident that they know what it is and the quality and the, and the suitability of what they currently have. Um, it covers the common areas only, such as the means of escape, plant rooms, risers, and any other shared areas, car parks, car parks, lounges, etc. It is non-intrusive in nature, but it does include looking at a sample of the flat entrance doors and the riser cupboards. It includes uh, access where possible to roof voids, and it should include the separation construction between the common areas and the residential blocks themselves. But we don't need to actually undertake any opening up works. Um, and of course, it must include a consideration of the external wall and any attachments. So that's a typical type one assessment. A type two is very similar to a type one in respect of its scope, but it does have a degree of intrusivity. We will start looking um, at the walls and uh, actually, and it generally requires a contractor to be involved to open up 
or make good. Um, and if, effectively, it's it's probably the least used type of fire risk assessment because it, do, it doesn't really provide us with too much information other than the fact that the, the, the means of escape is protected um, and uh, we are certain that the, the separation between the, the flats and the common areas is, is there. One that most people are now moving towards is a type three fire risk assessment, where this is a much more whole building consideration and is in line with the Building Safety Act and the guidance that's out there as well. It covers the common areas and then a sample of the dwellings, or if we've just got common areas, uh, we will also include any, com uh, sorry, commercial areas, we will include those commercial areas and should include those commercial areas as well. But again, it is non-intrusive in nature. It does include, as it does, as it did with a type one, um, a sample of the flats, um, the roof voids, the separation construction, and very importantly, consideration of that external wall again. Now, a lot of people get very concerned because they believe they're actually looking at areas that perhaps they have no control over. So the, the guidance that's come out within the draft code and hopefully is going to remain within the code is that actually what we're looking to do here is a visual inspection when we're actually undertaking a type three assessment within the demised areas. And we're looking at areas such as just purely the integrity of the fire resisting elements, the walls, floors, the ceilings, between the dwelling and other dwellings as well. We are looking to see to make sure the maximum travel distances um, from any point within the flat are in accordance with the design and the approval, that the hallway, if it needs to be protected, is protected, that the, the openings, um, uh, the door to the um, entrance is easy to open, that the Safety of inner rooms is, is such that it's, it's satisfactory, that the means of escape arrangements from any upper levels in things such as masonettes are in place. And then we've got the equipment side of it to make sure that uh, smoke and heat alarms are there uh, and sprinkler and mist systems are there. Now, the reason why I mentioned those specifically is because, um, and many of you will, will often find, people often remove smoke detection systems or they will cover them or will tape over them or they will do something with sprinkler and uh, water mist systems because they don't want to see it. Well, unfortunately, that needs to be rectified. And just I'm mentioning this because this is really important. If um, the owner of the building for which we're, they are responsible for is providing electrical and heating systems within those demised areas, then that must be included. Anything that's provided by the tenant is excluded. Um, yes, you do have a duty of care to inform people if there's, there's some concerns. But the vast majority of the issues that we're looking at here are outside of the control of the, of the tenants. Um, unless, of course, they've decided to remove doors and, as I said, remove smoke, heat detectors or paint over or cover up sprinklers and misting systems. The last one is really a type four. It's a whole building approach again. So the scope is exactly the same with regards to the uh, type three assessment. There is a degree of intrusivity here um, in respect of both the common areas and demised areas, which is why most people tend not to want to do this. <coughs> because you tend to have to go into the walls between the flats. And if those flats are occupied, they don't want you to do that. There are methods that can be achieved in order to do that very simply. But again, most people don't want to do it. It is the most comprehensive fire risk assessment that's out there. So why wouldn't you want to do it if you want to know all of the fire risks for that particular building? But the main reason it's often used is where there is a reason to suspect that there are some serious risks to the residents, both in respect of fire from their own dwellings or from neighbors dwellings as well. So if there is evidence to suggest that we've got problems, people complaining about smells from other people's cooking, people complaining that, um, uh, that they can hear or see certain things that suggest maybe that the compartmentation isn't satisfactory, then that's at the stage when you should be looking at a type four risk assessment. Okay, so I, I've gone through those particular parts and I wanna spend the next uh, five, 10 minutes and I will follow on that 
um, on management of building safety risks, because this is really important because the accountable person for an occupied higher risk building um, has got some duty. They've got the duty to prevent the building safety risk materializing and then reduce the severity. And section 84 of this particular um, act talks about the fact that there will be steps that need to be taken in order to achieve that in higher risk buildings. So your fire risk assessment may highlight concerns, in which case you've got a duty to do something about them. And the, the risk to the safety in about people is um, what a building risk actually is, is defined within section 62. And that's really about the fire spread and structural failure. I know there's a lot of, of words in here. I know you're going to get copies of the slides. So I just really want to quickly go through this particular part because whilst it is important, we really were focusing today on section 156. So one of the things that the, the Act is talking about is that accountable persons have got to act in accordance with the prescribed principles. They've got to undertake those actions properly and that they've got to have a management system in place. And so you'll see um, uh, that's, uh, that part five of the Act is, is being um, very heavily pushed at the moment by the regulator because their concerns are is that uh, are the majority of people that they are seeing with safety case reports just don't have the appropriate safety management system in place to manage those risks. The prescribed principles are actually outlined within the higher risk buildings management of safety risks regulations. Um, and I just want to quickly then jump through into that. So regulation four of that piece of legislation sets out 10 very clear steps um, and principles upon which you should be managing risk. The first idea is to avoid building safety risks. That's very obvious. The next thing is to actually evaluate building safety risks that cannot be avoided and identifying proportionate measures that uh, are required to address, to reduce or to mitigate and then control those risks. And we should be looking to actually control those risks rather than just reduce. That should be our aim. That we should be combating risks at source by introducing those proportional measures at the earliest opportunities, ideally during the design and the construction, rather than retrofitting of systems. But if retrofitting is required, then the Act effectively says that you've got to go through that process. That you've got to have suitable and proportionate systems for the maintenance and management and testing of and inspection, sorry, of all of the safety measures that are in place, whether that is the active systems, your fire alarm systems, sprinklers, uh, ventilation systems, as well as the passive systems, the, the, um, the fire protection to beams and columns, et cetera. All of those needs to be checked and to be maintained effectively. And then we've got some very unusual approaches or wording that's been included within the, the uh, uh, principles. And that is all about collective and protective measures and priority over those individual measures. It then talks about engaging and detailing with technical progress. So dealing with things such as um, lithium ion batteries. And I know there are there's a lot of concern over lithium ion batteries, um, especially in respect of scooters and e-bikes. Um, and being able to adapt to that and being able to deal with those types of issues has to be dealt with within the assessment process and then how you deal with that assessment afterwards. Where it's reasonable to do so, you have got to replace the dangerous with the non-dangerous or less dangerous. It's a very unusual set of words there, but that's effectively what the, the regulations require. And that you've got to consider the impact on residents. You've effectively got to engage with residents. You've then also got to make sure that and this is the owner's responsibility here, is to make sure that anybody who's working on or in or around that particular building is provided with appropriate instructions and information about the risks. So it's making sure that you have an understanding of those risks before you even go into that building. You need to make sure that those type of processes are in place. And the final one is all about competence. And competence here is key. And I'm very conscious that I'm, I'm coming towards my end and I I might just jump over the, the, the last few processes here, but I just want to spend one minute on competence because competence here is very key. And what they've done is within the prescribed principles suggested that a person 
can have individual competence, but we can also then, if it's not an individual, we could be looking at the organizational capability. And there are there is some very, very good guidance out there now in respect of organizational capability coming from the likes of the Building Safety Alliance. They've got a fantastic document out called BSA1. Um, and I would strongly recommend that you looked at it. So competence is key. So the last thing I just really wanted to mention uh, here is talk about the principles. They cannot be delivered or considered in isolation. That uh, it's really important that we see this as a series of layers of protection. That we cannot just deal with one rather than the other. That we have to look at this whole process um, on a much more holistic basis. There are different layers, different barriers um, and layers of protection that need to be considered. But we have to look at that holistic approach. That holistic approach is really key if we're going to get an improvement in fire risk and fire risk management uh, as a whole. And as I said, with those numerous preventative and protective barriers, it is essential that we look at all fire safety risks. And that is where Section 157 is pushing us all to. Sophie, I've got a few more slides, but I don't think it's worthwhile going through them. I'm conscious that we've got 10 minutes. So um, I'm sure there are going to be some questions um, that uh, will, be, will be asked or have been asked. So um, I'm going to stop it at that particular point. Thank you. Thank you, David. We, we have had some questions come in and um, I would like to take Sarah's question uh, as a first time. And just for the avoidance of that, we will share the complete slide deck uh, afterwards. Um, Sarah's question, uh, and I, I think it was or it became apparent during your presentation, but I think it's such an important point because there's so much confusing information out there. Uh, it is focusing on when I was in a course on a similar topic, I was constantly told that all amendments to the fire safety order was all only applicable to residential. Um, who is right. And, and this may have been dependent on timings when the course was perhaps held. But, but David, can we just settle this matter loud and clear? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the regulation uh, change, i.e. the amendment to the regulator of form fire safety order, because of section 156 applies to all types of buildings. Now the regulation changes under the Fire Safety Act, which I mentioned right at the very beginning, you are right, only applies to residential blocks. But the changes because of section 156 in respect of the content and the style of your fire risk assessment affects every type of building that's covered under the FSO. Thank you, David. And uh, I think what we might also do after the webinar is share the uh, government guidance uh, on these changes of Section 156, uh, which is extremely explicit into which buildings it does apply to, and it does apply to all non-domestic premises and also then non-domestic parts of multi-site residential. So it couldn't be more clear that it is applicable. Um, Katie has also asked a very good question, but before we um, get to that, I would like to pose you another question around the quality of fire risk assessments. And obviously it's very clear that there are a whole bunch of new requirements, um, but FMs, when they are procuring, are there any particular tips you can give them what to look for to make sure that they get the right quality of fire risk assessment? I think um, let's, let's start with the obvious thing, competence. Um, I think you need to be focusing uh, firstly on the competence of the person who's going to be undertaking your assessment. Are they already part of an accredited scheme? I would strongly recommend that you look to actually take people from an accredited scheme um, because that means that they, they will be on a regular um, uh, be undertaken on regular checks and uh, on that whole process. I think when you come to procure your fire risk assessments, I think you need to be very clear about the scope that you are looking for. And I think that is really important. And again, if it is a residential block, we would strongly recommend, uh, especially if it's a high risk block, to go down the type three or type four, depending upon what you have already. 
Um, the reason for that is because the regulator is expecting it, the guidance is requiring it, um, and you might as well go through that process straight away rather than have to later on redo it and therefore add additional cost. So I think first things first then, competence first, scope. The last thing I would strongly recommend is if you are basing your decision purely on cost, then as someone else has turned around and said, who is a, an extremely, it was in the press, then you are already part of the problem. You're part of the race to the bottom. You should be basing it on quality and basing it on the needs of the occupiers and the needs of the owners. And if it's just purely on cost, that is not going to be acceptable. Thank you, David. That's a very strong and powerful message. Um, and just for our audience, there is going to be a uh, BSI standard for fire risk assessors. Uh, David touched on that in his presentation, and we're expecting it uh, to be published in quarter one of 2025. Um, and actually, one of the trends that we're seeing following the uh, second phase uh, Grenfell inquiry report is that the Home Office is looking to make it a regulated profession. Uh, so there are much more stringent requirements coming uh, our way in terms of who you uh, employ to carry out these uh, fire risk assessments. Um, now, I would like to um, also touch on the fact that um, Katie is, well, information, it's, it's always important, isn't it? And it's one of the golden threads, no pun intended, of the Building Safety Act. Uh, Katie is asking around one of the root problems that she sees is incompetent risk assessment and often a failure to understand the building strategy at a structural level particularly compartmentation. Should we not be calling for a safety pack, including a fire strategy and compartment drawings, as it, as it is critical that this information is shared during all school works and correct fire stopping considerations given? Now, um, Katie would like our thoughts on that, or more yours. Um, and we'll get to that. But there was also a question from Mark around um, well, asking for confirmation if it is a legal requirement to have a building fire strategy. And I, I think, David, this is a multi-layered yes. question around okay. what so, standards are being developed and what is expected under the Golden Thread. Yeah, let's let's deal with Katie's part first. Um, yes, I totally agree with you, Katie. Um, I would strongly recommend that fire risk assessors are provided with a copy of the um, safety strategy for that particular building. Um, I'm, I'm talking here about an as-built strategy rather than what we tend to get when we are assessing buildings is people say, yeah, I've got a strategy. Here it is. It was the design strategy. Uh, and yet we've often found that the design strategy bears no resemblance to what was actually built or constructed. Um, you're quite right. It would be great if we had a compartmentation drawing so we can very clearly understand where those compartmentation lines are and having all of those, including plans, I think is actually vital in order to achieve that. Do we often get it? No. Why? Because many managing agents, many facilities managers just haven't had that provided to them. It hasn't been transferred over to them. That golden thread of information just hasn't happened, which is why that golden thread is there. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get the name of the gentleman who asked the secondary question, but I just want to respond to that particular part as well. Um, at this particular moment, there is no legal requirement to have a fire strategy. What, though, the Grenfell Tower Inquiry Phase 2 report has recommended to the government is that every higher risk building, and remember the definition of that higher risk building is most likely going to change. It's not just going to focus on residential blocks. Um, we're talking here about vulnerable persons as well. Um, and the presence of vulnerable persons. So we're most likely going to have some commercial uh, buildings that are going to be included as well, but we'll soon see about that. The law request, sorry, from the, uh, the, the inquiry is that it will be a legal requirement for every building to have an as-built fire strategy produced by a regulated fire engineer. 
And so we've got two elements there. So there, there is likely going to be a change uh, in the future in respect of that. So, um, and I, I'm, I per, I'm certainly at, at ARC, we, we uh, applaud that and, and we strongly recommend and strong, sorry, strongly um, uh, agree with, with those particular recommendations. Thank you, David. And, and I'd like to join in that uh, agreement because we at IWFM and the Building Safety Alliance as well, the work that we're doing through them, are very much trying to drive up the standards of the Golden Thread piece. Um, and uh, what no doubt members will want to know and, and the wider audience is that we will be monitoring some of the developments around uh, fire safety strategies um, and, and what good looks like um, because there are standards of the development and, and we are engaging with that entire piece. I am afraid I am going to have to draw it to close here, David. There are a few more uh, questions, but we will want to pick those up uh, and respond to the Q&A with a follow-up article. So please um, look out for any further news coming uh, from us because there, there are some really important points that are being asked, including uh, on issues like accredited schemes for the future uh, that are currently under development. Um, but really, uh, thank you, David, and thank you to the listeners as well. A recording will be available. The slides will become available as well. Um, the recording can be shared with uh, wider people. Um, I hope that you're starting to see the wood through the trees or the trees through the wood and what the regulatory changes really mean for you when you are procuring or carrying out fire risk assessment. And we will be doing a few more webinars on building safety in the next few months, including with ARC, Workplace Risk. And um, so please look out for the listings. Um, thank you to Lucy and uh, Winna as well for your support on this webinar. And I'll Hope to see everyone in a future episode. Thank you very much. Thank you.